Good evening and welcome to the Humanities in Class webinar series. Uh, tonight's discussion is titled Religious Literacy and Democratic Citizenship and will feature Diane Moore from the Harvard Divinity School. Uh, my name is Andy Mink and I'm joining you tonight from my home in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, uh, just down the road from the National Humanities Center, which is located in Durham. Uh, normally I have my colleague Libby Taylor here to help run the behind the scenes, but Libby's on maternity leave. And so tonight it'll be just me and Diane and we're pleased to be able to bring this uh, this in-depth conversation with you that we hope will be both relevant and compelling and give you many different uh, things to think about for your instruction starting tomorrow. Um, the webinar, as many of you might know, is an audio-only webinar that's associated with a PowerPoint that Diane has pulled together. Um, it's really critical that we get your chat and your feedback. So in the lower right-hand corner of the navigation column, uh, go to Training Control Panel, you'll see the chat box. As a matter of fact, I'd like you to go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know where you're from. And I think tonight, uh, maybe let us know what you teach. My sense is uh, of the nearly 200 registrants for tonight's webinar, it's probably the most diverse and multidisciplinary. And it sort of makes sense. Uh, my guess is in most uh, public schools, if not independent schools, that religious studies and religion explicitly isn't part of the curriculum, but it's very much part of the extracurricular work that we do in the sense that we find ways to embed it in our work and find ways to draw those connections between disciplines. I think you'll find that, uh, no pun intended, tonight's content is almost agnostic to the curriculum. And I'm very pleased that so many of you have joined us from multiple disciplines. So I say hi, uh, introduce yourself where you're from and let us know what you teach as well. Uh, the National Humanities Center is in our 40th year and we've been uh, supporting a fellowship class each year uh, that is dedicated to uh, innovative new and emerging scholarship in the humanities. Our education department extends that work by building bridges from the scholarship in the university world to the classroom. And I use the term classroom in very broad terms. Uh, this very much includes uh, K-12 uh, classrooms, but it also includes community college classrooms and undergraduate classrooms. And our goal, I think, is to really be clear about the value of the humanities and to be able to articulate um, exactly why uh, the humanities is such an important part of the of the curriculum that we teach. And at the end of the day, I think that really starts with content. And so these webinars are designed to be in-depth and, and professional collegial conversations around compelling topics. Uh, there are certainly times when uh, some of our teachers and participants find ways to integrate this work with their own classrooms and their own students, but it's really designed to give you a, a much deeper sense of and knowledge of uh, these topics. We do that in a variety of ways, including our online resources. You can get to america.org, um, americanclass.org anytime and download for free our exemplar uh, lessons that right now are pretty ha heavy on history and literature, but we'll be expanding uh, very soon. Uh, these webinars, again, are a chance to introduce scholars from around the country to you, the, the teaching uh, faculty, and we're very pleased that um, that you uh, have come, uh, probably for most of you, come directly from your classrooms to join us. You might note as you sign up, though, that many of our webinars are beginning to sell out, and I think we've probably hit eight or ten of our 25 this year that have sold out completely. Uh, our capacity is 200. Uh, we may seek to expand that capacity next year, but right now it really is a first come and first serve basis. If you do find a sold out webinar though, please email Libby Taylor. There's her address on the screen and let her know you'd like to be on the waiting list. Uh, even when it's sold out, we, we frequently get folks who have something come up as all of us uh, do and slots emerge and we'd be happy to add that to you at the, at the, uh, at the last minute. I also want to uh, remind you of an upcoming deadline for a summer institute at the National Humanities Center. Next July, we'll be hosting uh, 36 teachers from across the country uh, to a 10-day institute uh, to really uh, explore and look at the contested territory and America's role with Southeast Asia in the decades around the American Vietnam War. Um, we're currently accepting applications. There is a stipend of $2,100. And on March the 1st, we'll review those applications and select 36 participants. So if you're interested in that, please go ahead and begin the uh, application process. You can find information for that on our website. Uh, you see the URL there on the screen. And also you can go to the National uh, Endowment for the Humanities and apply in that way. All of our work is really intended to be as relevant and connected to the classroom as we can make it. And that's, that's very much supported by uh, our Teachers Advisory Council. These 14 educators are dedicated and talented, 
and they've really contributed quite a bit to both the materials we produce and the events that we host. As a matter of fact, I literally just got back today from Austin, Texas, uh, leading a workshop for teachers in the Austin area that was helped uh, convened by Cherry Whipple, who's in the photograph here. And it was a, a huge support in this workshop. So um, if you're interested in being a part of this uh, program for the next year, 2018-19 school year, uh, we will have application uh, information a little later this spring. Uh, tonight's uh, webinar uh, does come with a certificate of participation. Um, generally, when I close the room, and I usually leave it open about 15 minutes after the end of the webinar, um, you'll receive a questionnaire, a survey, and once that's completed, you'll be able to download your certificate. You can turn this into your administrator, or you can add it to your teaching portfolio, but it does give credit to uh, and acknowledge that you joined us for these 90 minutes. Uh, be patient with it. Sometimes it gets hung up in spam boxes and it gets hung up in the email cycle. Uh, but if you have any issues, please don't hesitate to email me directly and I'll be happy to look into it for you. So all that's really, I think, to frame tonight's uh, conversation, just an introduction to the center and what we do. But I, I actually like the, the subtitle to Diane's uh, webinar tonight uh, as a way to, to frame what I hope we understand, what we hope we accomplish, and that is understanding the complexities of contemporary human affairs. And you know, I think um, you'll find that the way that Professor Moore shares the work that she's doing at Harvard and the way that she works with classrooms and teachers, uh, the ways that we think about embedding and immersing um, this, this view uh, in the ways that religion can, can help make these connections is a, is a really critical one. So I'm very pleased that Diane can join us from uh, what I'm assuming to be cold uh, Boston right now. Um, Diane, I'm going to unmute you and welcome you to the program. And hey there, Diane, can you hear me? I can. Thanks so Thank much, you. Andy. Thank you for joining us. Great. Well, thank you. And thanks for this wonderful invitation. And thank you all for, for joining us tonight. I know I know that at the end of a, of a week, um, it can be a kind of heavy slog. So I feel very honored that you're that you're with us. My favorite thing to do is work with teachers. So so it's really my pleasure to be here with you. And I hope that my uh, comments tonight can be useful to you in your classroom. I'm very excited about about our um, our discussion this evening. So I hope that all of you had a chance to, or most of you had a chance to read the methods paper that I asked, uh, asked you to, to preview for, for tonight's session. The reason I wanted you to do that is what, essentially what I'm gonna do tonight is review that paper, but also use it as the platform for, for our discussion. I, before, I, before I launch into our, uh, the presentation for tonight, I just want to talk a little bit about, about my own background and my own work and, and what we're doing at the Religious Literacy Project uh, and what essentially motivates my work. I, I started thinking about religious literacy in this particular way um, in, in the context of my own work as a secondary school teacher. So I worked at Phillips Academy for uh, nearly 20 years. It was a very surprised decision for me to do that. I was already at Harvard and doing some other work in social ethics, which is where my training comes in, and um, took a one-year sabbatical replacement because I loved working with adolescents and, um, and ended up staying for, for nearly 20 years doing a variety of different things. But primarily, my big love there uh, at the academy was teaching in the classroom teaching philosophy and religious studies. And it was in that context that I realized not only do we have a real dearth of, of substantive material for teaching about religion uh, at that level, but also just the importance of having a better understanding of the power of religion in human experience, uh, realizing that without understanding that power, that, um, that, 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 that lack of understanding caused um, a tremendous amount of of, uh, of conflict. So so that was really it was it was out of my work um, that you all are continuing to do, and that I miss greatly actually. Um, that that sparked uh, uh, a lot of my most recent scholarship, particularly rooted in education, and then this framework for how to think about religion is really at the heart of everything we do through the Religious Literacy Project. And I just want to also say that tonight I won't be specifically talking about resources we have there, but I do want to encourage you to, to take a look at our website. We're getting ready to launch a, a brand new set of teacher resources that give case studies about 
how this method is applicable in the context of uh, people who have are teaching religions through the true traditions unit, maybe in a world history unit where you've got a, a session on religion, um, the unit on religion, or if it's in uh, uh, world culture courses, world geography courses, often there's isolated uh, units on religion, which is problematic from our perspective, but realize that many teachers have that uh, necessity. That's how they teach about religion. Uh, but also, we're working on a really exciting project called the Rush Project, Religion in U.S. History, where we're creating a, a host of resources for teachers that can supplement their U.S. history courses, and we're getting ready to launch that next fall. So we've got a lot of projects we're doing. We also are offering some trainings for teachers in an institute this summer that um, we, you can find out information about uh, on the Religious Literacy Project website. But enough of that. Let's uh, let's jump right into uh, the content for tonight. And I'm going to start with some fundamental premises that inform my work. And I'm going to uh, articulate four of those. The first seems quite self-evident in one way, but unfortunately it's not. Is that religion's relevant? Um, for so many years, um, in many disciplines taught in schools and in uh, public policy, initiative, particularly in international relations, people re believed that religion sh could be avoided and thought it was a good idea to avoid it. In fact, it, for in international relations, it was literally called the third rail for, for many, many years and still is, is a relatively marginal understanding of religion is still, um, is still practiced in many international relations contexts today. It's only in the last 30 or 40 years that that's really been challenged. And John Kerry, yes. Um, famously for those of us in religious studies, actually said, you know, our former Secretary of State said, if he had it to do over again, he would have majored in religion and religious studies, realizing its central importance for, um, for not only diplomacy, but just understanding fundamental issues in human affairs. So the whole framing of everything I'm going to talk about tonight is assuming that religion is relevant, not just in relationship to religious ritual and, and practice and beliefs, but um, for all dimensions of human experience. And we'll talk more about that as we move along. And, and Diane, let me interrupt briefly just to, to clarify that. And it, I think what I'm hearing too is that you're saying this from a, from a non-nationalistic perspective, right? You, this is a global perspective. Um, exactly, yeah, exactly. Us, us in this room, in this conversation, in this country. Absolutely. In fact, that's some of the following premises will make that even more explicit. But yes, I'm glad you're highlighting that, Andy. It is a critical piece. So second slide is the second premise is that there exists a widespread illiteracy about religion that I that spans the globe. I've had the incredible privilege of working with educators from very many parts of the of the of the world. Um, in India, in many parts of the Middle East. I'm currently working on a project with educators in Iraq. Um, working in uh, many parts of Africa, South Africa, Egypt, um, Tanzania, uh, 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 different parts of, of uh, Kenya, and then also in Indonesia and other places in South Asia, uh, along with obviously other a wide variety of places here in the United States. Initially, I would just say that that it, there's an illiteracy about religion in the U.S., but in this experience of working with educators globally, I realized that this phenomenon is actually really widespread, and it's very consistent, even though the particulars of these illiteracies will play themselves out, obviously, in different contexts, but there are, there are many dimensions of illiteracy about religion that are consistent, and it's one of um, what I've come to realize is one of the legacies of colonialism. Uh, we don't have time to go into that now, but that's a really critical, uh, important factor in some of the work we're doing at the Religious Literacy Project is looking at the legacies of colonialism and the ways they impact current challenges, and religion plays a really critical role in this. So this widespread illiteracy is something that I do claim now does span the globe uh, f out of this experience. Uh, so, third premise. Uh, go ahead. I, yeah. Before we move on, do you mind defining illiteracy in this context? What When you say that, that we're... Uh, this trend of being religiously illiterate, what, what exactly does that mean? Yeah, I'm going to, uh, when we get a little further in the slides, okay. I'm going to give the, the definition okay. of literacy and illiteracy. But um, so I think, so, gotcha. uh, so it, I, I think just laying out these f foundations of assumption and then moving into the definitions would probably be useful. Fantastic. Great. Okay. So third premise is that there are consequences of this. There are many, there are intellectual consequences. There are 
you know, a, a host of other consequences. The ones I'm most concerned about, though, are the civic consequences. Um, I'm trained as an ethicist. That's been my training. Was, uh, both I have degrees in religious studies and in ethics. And so for me, the consequences I'm most concerned about are the ones are the civic consequences and that that illiteracy fuels antagonism, hinders respect for pluralism, peaceful coexistence and cooperative endeavors in local, national and global arenas. So this is my, my concern. This is why I teach about these issues. And that the third, uh, fourth premise, if we can move along, Andy, uh, that it's possible to diminish illiteracy by teaching how to understand the complexities of religion and human experience from a non-sectarian perspective. So I believe that if we have a better understanding of religion, um, we can diminish the consequences of this lack of understanding and enhance um, and enhance a better uh, foundation for, for not just human diversity and pluralism, but uh, to better understand the negative forces that religion uh, fuels in our context to try to mitigate those negative consequences and then promote more positive ones. So I think, I'm, if I'm remembering correctly, I think the, the next slide, Andy, is the definition. Yeah, so, so the definition of, of literacy, I'm, I'm going to say illiteracy would be the opposite of this, but the definition of literacy you have in that methods paper, but I'm going to, I want to, I want to highlight it here because there's a lot of people using language around religious literacy uh, today, and, and, and it has lots of different meanings. I just want to root um, my understanding of what we're talking about through the Religious Literacy Project. So it entails the ability to discern and analyze the fundamental intersections of religion and social, political, cultural life through multiple lenses. That's the first part. So go ahead, Andy. And again, you all have this in, your, in, the, in the Methods paper, but I want to review it here. So specifically, a religiously literate person will possess, one, a basic understanding of the history, central texts, et cetera, where applicable beliefs, practices, uh, and contemporary manifestations of several of the world's religious traditions. Usually that's what people think about when they think about religious literacy. They think about, okay, beliefs, history, central texts, et cetera. But the second part of this definition is key to our understanding and my own as a scholar and then are the, is how, uh, back up a little, uh, Andy, sorry, uh, second part of this, as they arose out of and continue to be shaped by particular social, historical, cultural context. So understanding the history, central texts, et cetera, is not an isolated entity and, or uh, isolated framework. It's about the context, the historical, social context out of which these religious practices arise. And then, then uh, move ahead, Andy, please. And then specifically, a second part of the definition is a religiously literate person will possess the ability to discern and explore the religious dimensions of political, social, and cultural expressions across time and place. So we're really challenging the widespread notion that religion is an isolated entity, that it's not political or economic, but that it exists in a, in a kind of private sphere, which is itself a, a commentary about the Protestant uh, hegemony in US context, especially and in the Western context. And that we're really saying, you know, you can't separate the power of religion in these ways, even though the practices of religion in some contexts may take place in, uh, in individual contexts. So Andy, were you gonna jump in here with something? Yeah, I think that uh, you, you've, you've answered my question, thank you. Great, okay. So, the, yeah, so if you could advance the slide. So then these four assumptions about, uh, about religion then form the foundation of the, of the method that I'm going to speak about. And these foundations are, are what religious studies scholars share. Uh, so I'm actually going to move on outside of this and talk about my own framework and what we do through the Religious Literacy Project, which would be uh, adding a critical theory dimension to this. But these four basic tenets are fundamental to religious studies scholars. And this is part of the guidelines that um, I helped uh, create for the American Academy of Religion that are available also as another resource for you uh, through the Religious Literacy Project. But these four assumptions are just w fundamental ways to understand religion. And that's, again, the framework I'm introducing you to tonight is that uh, how to think about religion less than the content of religion. And these four fundamental pieces are just, uh, again, uniform across all traditions from an academic study of religion perspective. And the first distinction is to be made, which is to make a, make a distinction between a devotional expression of a religious belief, which is what all believers, all people of faith 
are appropriately engaged in and entitled to, to offer, uh, but to make a distinction between the devotional assertion and then the study or the engagement of diverse devotional assertion, which is the study of religion, which is the academic study of religion. Now, when I make that distinction, I also don't mean it to seem like the devotional assertion is the kind of heart and soul of religion and the academic study is somehow cold and calculating and, and kind of neutral. That's not the case at all. In fact, to be able to understand and study diverse devotional assertions requires an, a deeply empathetic understanding and, le, and giving legitimacy to the diversity of expressions theologically and, and in relationship to faith. Um, and to really understand, not just to know that there's diversity, but to understand what fuels that diversity. What does it mean for someone to hold a belief that is um, very different from, from, from the norm or different from my own personal uh, set of assumptions if we're approaching this from an academic study of religion? Or even what does it mean to, to empathetically understand a position of someone who maybe holds a belief that is, uh, that, that is uh, abhorrent to me? And so the study of religion requires a, a, a empathetic understanding of those diversities. And that's, that's a very powerful framing and way to think about the study of religion that isn't, again, just this you know, removed, distant, cold, calculating idea, but a really deeply engaged one. Um, the reason that it's important to make this first distinction here is that we often conflate these two. And then, in fact, it's not uncommon that when we want to learn about a religion, we're going to call in a religious uh, leader of a particular uh, perspective or practitioners of a religion to learn about that tradition. In a moment, I'll say why that's a problem, uh, because there are different kinds of skills involved with what it means to be a religious leader uh, or a devotee of a religion and the st academic study of religion. So the, the, making that distinction is really critical. And in the work I do with students and with teachers, I'm very transparent in my classrooms when I was working in secondary schools to be just really clear. These are the tools I want to give students when I teach about religion, these four uh, basic fundamental tenets. So help them understand these distinctions. So the, the, the last three are relatively straightforward, and I'll move a little more quickly. Um, uh, to, to go through these. But then the, the second tenet of a religious studies perspective is that religions are internally diverse. Again, that's a truism. We can kind of know that, but we often conflate this as well. We often talk about all Christians believe or all Muslims believe. But in fact, religions aren't just internally diverse by uh, different sects, so Sunni or Shia or Methodist and Roman Catholic or Quaker. Um, but they're diverse even within religious communities, even within religious families, because religions are living traditions. They evolve and change, which is the third tenet. They are, they are not static entities. They um, are rich and, uh, again, embedded in notions of every uh, historically and culturally embedded. So this framework, this framework of how to think about religions as internally diverse uh, is not, again, just about the sects and distinctions in that way, formal distinctions, but about the actual expression and experience of religion. And that richness is what is uh, so vital and compelling about religion, but is often overlooked when we make claims about particular religious beliefs and assumptions. And then, uh, again, uh, religions evolve and change. They're not static. They are historically and culturally contingent. Um, I use a quick example in the um, in the in the document, but I'll highlight it here. A, a common one that's un that lots of people don't know here in the U.S. is that uh, we often associate Southern Baptists with being very, uh, very vocal and very publicly engaged with critical questions of, 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 of um, public policy in lots of arenas. But one that they're very active in is, is in, a, in the abortion uh, debates and the uh, legitimacy or moral legitimacy of abortion. So they're very, very vocal now and have been for quite some time uh, and at the forefront of some public policies that are curbing uh, and challenging um, the legitimacy and moral legitimacy of abortion. Very few people know that from 19, uh, early on, right before Roe v. Wade in the 70s and then following, that the Southern Baptist Convention actually passed a series of uh, resolutions that supported the moral legitimacy of abortion. Um, uh, under certain circumstances, like the life and health of the mother, the economic security of the family, the health of the fetus, 
um, and uh, and and a few other caveats so to say basically under certain circumstances absolutely more that that there's a moral uh, legitimacy of abortion they reaffirmed those uh, those resolutions two or three times into the early 1990s and then, then later it started to change and that now then in 2003 they passed a resolution saying that all previous resolutions about abortion are null and void and now the resolution that stands is the one that states that um, all abortion is murder so whatever you think about abortion, the point here is that even within a context of a particular denomination in the United States over the last 40 years, we see tremendous change about a, 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 a specific issue that, uh, again, is replicated in all other religious traditions about the kind of evolution and change, the dy dynamism of religious expression. So religions evolve and change. They're not static. They're not um, uniform. And they're not ahistorical. The last one is the one that's, uh, again, I think it's understandable when we state it, but it's the, more, it's the one that's more difficult, I think, to, to grasp. And that's the one I'm going to focus on in relationship to giving extra tools to help understand. Religious ideologies are embedded in all dimensions of human experience in both historical and contemporary manifestations. That assertion is the one that is hard for people to get their head around because we have for so long been taught that religions, again, uh, exist in this private, isolated sphere that is not relevant to political, economic, cultural uh, life, uh, other parts of our political, economic, and cultural life. And it's that assumption that I want to, um, that I'll end up focusing on. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to engage with a question now. So, Andy, if you could move the next slide into the next slide. Before we, before we introduce you to kind of some frameworks to understand this notion of how religions are embedded and how we can understand it, I've got this quote from an educator, a uh, proving educator, uh, Brazilian educator, Paulo Freire, who I think many of you probably know, well known for critical theory in education. He's re re very much a contemporary, died not so long ago. Um, in, in his seminal work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, he has this quote, Never in the history of humanity has violence been initiated by the oppressed. Never in the history of humanity has violence been initiated by the oppressed. So before we move on, I'd just like to, all of you in the chat room, if you can just say, do you agree or disagree with this quote? Uh, jump in and just, just say, and again, no, no wrong answers here, because uh, you can interpret it in lots of ways, but I'm just curious to see how many of you agree or disagree? And if I could get all of you to, to just jump in here. So as the chat scrolls up, uh, Diane, we're going to have to keep our eyes on it. I'm, I'm certainly seeing a little bit of both. My own sort of eyeball test shows it might be about half, half right now. Um, yeah. There's certainly yeah. both, there's certainly folks saying both, both agree. Yeah, disagree. yeah that's, that's absolutely. Okay, all right. It, uh, if you are, um, if you are, uh, if it ends up being half or more, that's pretty unusual because usually when, I, and this is I, uh, terrific in one way, because usually when I ask this question, almost everybody for the most part will initially disagree. Uh, so you keep putting your, putting your, putting your uh, votes in, please keep, keep scrolling. But then I'm going to let's go ahead and move along, Andy, because I want to um, make sure we just get out the foundations and then we'll open it up for, for more general questions and answers. Um, I'm going to introduce you now. And you again, you were introduced to him briefly through the uh, Mathis paper. And this is the piece that is moving now into critical theory. So this is many, many religious studies scholars and. Uh, other and scholars from other fields in the cross-disciplinary uh, fields of postmodernism and of critical theory uh, would hold these the, this framework that I'm about to introduce to you uh, would share and believe that you know also practice these these foundations. Uh, but this is not this is not uniformly shared by all religious studies scholars. So, so it's a subset of religious studies, if you will. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to Jan Galtung, who's a father of peace studies, again, uh, Norwegian. He's, he was actually trained as a mathematician, which is very interesting. Let me tell you a little bit of background to, about him before I uh, review, because you've read it, but just review the, the framework that he's introducing us to. 
Um, what brought him to this work, actually, is that Galton has what he calls a, a relatively optimistic view of human nature and capacity. Um, and that isn't that view of optimistic view of human nature and capacity is something that I also share. I share it for a host of reasons, one of which I think is I'm a Midwesterner and I think it's kind of in our DNA. Um, and I still hold it, even though I'm out here in the East with all these, you know, Northeast pessimists. But um, I, 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 I share that optimistic view of human nature and capacity. And that's something, again, that's not like, and not, not everybody does share it. I, it's rare for me to encounter a teacher that doesn't have an optimistic view of human nature and capacity, though this is one of the reasons I love working with teachers. So I don't know what all of you in the room think, but I'm owning my own optimism and sharing it with Galton. And it, it's this optimism that Galton said he had to then confront, how is it with an optimistic view of human nature and capacity that we continue to, 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 to basically perpetuate heinous crimes against humanity, heinous crimes against one another that we don't seem to learn from our history, particularly something like the Holocaust, when of course the, the rallying cry following the Holocaust was never again, that we would never again have an atrocity like this uh, and allow for this, this massive genocide to happen. Well, of course we know that there have been genocides since there were genocides before, that in fact, we, we don't seem to learn. And Galton had to confront, as I think we all do, what's going on. Either he felt like he had to change his optimistic view or he had to have a different answer because it couldn't just be that, that there's something inevitable because that's pretty pe pessimistic. And it was that kind of urgency that brought him to engage with this um, representation of different forms of violence and peace. And so I want to introduce this to you because as a vehicle to understand how religions are embedded um, in all dimensions of human experience. And I think it's through this language of Galton that we can see one lens into understanding that embeddedness. So again, you, you read this in the uh, Methods paper, but for Galton, rather than assume that there's only, only direct violence, which is what we associate with violence, uh, he divides it up into two other, uh, three categories. And then he also has correlations of then direct structural cultural violence and direct structural and cultural peace. So if we move through the slides, I'm going to give you these brief definitions of, of the direct structural and cultural violence first, and then we're going to uh, come back to the Freire quote. So next slide, if you could. So direct violence is what we usually associate with violence, behaviors that serve to threaten life itself, diminish one's capacity to meet basic human needs, killing, maiming, bullying, sexual assault, emotional manipulation. These are all, under Galtung's terms, uh, forms of direct violence. And ones that I think we tend to, again, usurp all forms of violence under this quote. But let's move on to structural violence. He adds then a second category, which is not unique to him, but it, it's particular his uh, framing of this. Again, many critical theorists will share these assumptions. Structural violence represents the systemic ways in which some groups are hindered from equal access to opportunities, goods, and services that enable the fulfillment of basic human needs. These can be formal as in legal structures that enforce marginalization, apartheid in South Africa, or Jim Crow laws in the US are excellent examples. Uh, or they could be culturally functional but without legal mandates, such as limited access to quality education, limited access to health care uh, for marginalized groups, et cetera. So structural forms of violence are, 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 don't manifest in a particular action, but they, are, um, they, they, they manifest over time. And they are embedded as, uh, again, limited access some, uh, by, to some groups and individuals to fundamental um, uh, goods and services that can enhance uh, and, and create fulfilling life. So structural violence is key. For Galton, the key, so these, this notion is not new to us. I would fall into the racism, sexism, uh, heterosexism, religious um, bigotry frameworks would, would fall under structural violence. But for Galton to answer his question about why is it that we continue to perpetuate these heinous forms of crimes against one another, is the heart for him is in what he calls cultural violence. So Andy, if you can shift uh, the slide one more up. Cultural violence for Galtung is the embedded forms of uh, social norms 
uh, values that are embedded in societies that make direct and structural violence seem natural or right, or at least acceptable. And this for Galtung is the key to the perpetuation of, of forms of violence that we seem to, seems to be inevitable, but he doesn't believe is. And that's what is both optimistic about his, his framework, as well as the importance of, of critical reflection to give people language to ask questions about what are the embedded assumptions within a given culture that make direct and structural violence seem natural and right. So again, in the Methods paper, I gave a brief description uh, to use the, to, to, to lay this out of, of um, chattel slavery. So in the United States, of course, you can, we have a couple options. When we think about our history and we think about the history, we have, we have many parts of our history we should be very proud of and can be, but there are also very many parts of our history that as a US citizen, I, I, I feel like is critical for me to confront to help learn from those the, the, some heinous forms of our history from the past and try to, to keep from reproducing them. One of them is chattel slavery. Um, and so we have a couple options when we look back at, uh, at, the, at the history of slave ownership here in the United States. We could look back and say, what kind of awful human beings were they that owned slaves? With, and with you know, that kind of sense of, of who, what, who could possibly do that? And embedded in that kind of assertion, which is a common one, are two things. One is I would never be like that if I were there, if I were them. That would, I would never own slaves. That's kind of an embedded assumption or um, implied assumption by that comment. And then the other is that they're, they're not like us, that they're different than we are. Uh, and Galton says that's a common way we think historically about these kinds of challenges. Uh, but he says he doesn't think it's either intellectually or morally sound, and I would agree with him. Rather than look back and say, what kind of awful human beings were those slaves? Uh, they must not be like me. Uh, a more challenging and I think relevant question is, what if we look back and say they were just like me? Uh, then if they're, if they're just like me, the question then is not what kind of awful human beings were they, but what was going on? If they're just like me, that they had uh, aspirations, that they had families they loved and children they cared for, and pride in their moral uh, presence in the world and uh, e e excitement about, about the kind of roles that they can play, excitement about their human agency, uh, to be able to, to, to feel like that their presence makes the world a better place. If they're people just like me, then I have to ask a different question about what was going on that gave legitimacy to chattel slavery. And this is where religion not solely about religion, but a way that we can understand the embedded ways that religions function. So if we look back at that time, we know, and many of you are history teachers, you know this well, and I hope the structure helps give you language for this, is that in fact, religion played a really strong role in cultural violence in the sense that religions throughout, throughout many parts of the North and the South coming out of pulpits on Sunday mornings would be uh, moral, uh, uh, support for the for the existence of the institution of chattel slavery, uh, coming out of particular interpretations of the Bible, coming out of particular institutional assertions that religious uh, communities made that that supported and gave moral sanction to slavery. So it was religiously supported in very embedded ways. Uh, that would be for Galton a form of cultural violence where religion gave sanction to the structural forms of violence that chattel slavery represented and the direct forms of violence that it also uh, represented. Um, another dimension of what gave the chattel slavery legitimacy embedded assumptions was biology, that there was a whole a science called phrenology that was a biological science that was taught in institutions like Harvard, like Princeton, as part of intro to biology courses where the, it was a science of skull shapes and sizes. And it won't surprise you to hear that, the, uh, that there was, first of all, a distinction made between skull shapes and sizes of, of those humans from African, what they perceived to be of African descent uniquely, and skull shapes and sizes of those of European descent, and then everything in between. But those two, uh, the spectra, the ones from African descent were deemed to be uncivilized in 
incapable of intellectual understanding and incapable of fundamental forms of civilization itself. And the ones with uh, Western European skull shapes and sizes, again, the distinction itself was dubious, but at the time was seemed to be a scientific and neutral endeavor, were d deemed to be the height of civilization of intelligence and of, of, of human capability. So right there, just and those are just two, very small but very influential strands where people were raised in these assumptions that were taught in schools, that were deeply embedded in the culture that made chattel slavery and the ownership of human beings both right, good, and natural, and seemingly inevitable. So that's the uh, representation of cultural violence. Now, just as an aside, this, uh, the opposite, I also just want to say it was also religion, as I think we all know, that was uh, functioning then also to challenge the legitimacy of those expressions and that many, uh, it was many uh, leaders of the abolition movement were themselves religiously uh, d uh, affiliated, both Jews and Christians from lots of different contexts were challenging the moral legitimacy of slavery through their religion. And Galton would call that a form of cultural peace where you were embedded forms of, of, um, of human expression, human dignity, um, human representation would be the foundation to challenge structural and direct forms of violence. So again, religion isn't one or the other. It doesn't function in positive or negative ways. It's a powerful force that functions in all of these contexts. And the question here is not, is religion relevant, but how is it relevant? And how do we tease out the strands of how it's functioning in any given cultural or historical moment. And this language of Galtung, of direct structural and cultural violence, gives us some tools to be able to recognize not just religious forces, obviously I've just used it also to look at the forces in biology and there are other forces too, politics, government, assumptions, but how do we, do these tools just help us understand what's going on in a given cultural moment and historical moment that gives sanction or legitimacy to direct and structural forms of violence. And in my, my experience is that learning these tools and asking these questions, the critical reflective questions, is, is itself to uncover the fact that these historical expressions and experiences are not inevitable. Um, the, and, and, and that they actually are malleable, that history is malleable, that we as human agents make a difference is the most optimistic dimension of this uh, notion. And Galtung's answer to this question of why we perpetuate violence, because we often do it unwittingly. We reproduce without critical reflection the embedded assumptions that give rise to these forms of violence, structural and direct. And finally, the, the most critical one, uh, and the reason I teach this and why I think it's, uh, back, back up if you could. Um, Sorry about that. Uh, is that the real question for us uh, and for Galtung um, is not, it's what, the reason we look historically is because it's easier to see these things historically, but the real question for us and what Galtung teaches and what I feel most committed to myself is that uh, is how do we use these tools to ask ourselves, how do we think, what are the embedded norms and assumptions in our own context that are giving rise to structural and direct forms of violence? And what will people in 50 or 100 or 150 years look back and say about us? And when, they, when they look back and say, what kind of people were they that allowed for whatever, fill in the blank? Um, and that's where I think the most critical and important dimension of Galtung's um, frameworks, the reason I feel excited about them, is that they invite a consideration ourselves for the current questions. So now flip, flip over, Andy, if you could. So this is another question, and then we're going to return to the fairy quote. So... Thinking about this notion of cultural, structural, and direct violence, we've got the um, Black Lives Matter movement. I've got an echo, Andy. I don't know if you've got it. I, I don't hear the echo, no. Okay, then I'll, I'll just, okay, good. Um, and so we know, of course, that we've got a Black Lives Matter movement that arises out of a host of a confluence of many, many cultural factors. Um, and then one of the comments in response to, to Black Lives Matter is, uh, all lives matter. You can't just say black lives matter, but actually um, 
the concern is like, well, no, Black Lives Matter, yes, but actually all lives matter. So I'm just going to ask and ask you to put in the chat room is in this context of cultural, direct, structural forms of violence, all lives matter. Do you think it's a form of cultural violence or an expression of cultural peace? How many, what, and just, just put in the chat room, cultural violence or cultural peace, or just to write violence or peace. And that's going to give you a chance to, to catch your breath, Diane. And, yeah. um, and I, I have a feeling, and again, we can, as we watch it scroll up, we, we should really, you know what we'll do next time, Diane, is we'll do a poll. We'll have a poll everywhere, maybe. And uh, we can yeah. watch how people do that. But it seems like there's a lot of violence coming in. Um, yeah, fabulous. Yeah, it's it's Great. again just the eyeball the eyeball test tells me that there's a there's a couple of piece, but it's primarily violence. Primarily violence, and I and from a Galtung and Frarian perspective, it is a form of cultural violence. Now it's 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 counterintuitive for many many people, as as I think is obvious by the by the by the comments. I mean, when you when you hear someone say all lives matter, on one level, who can argue with all lives matter? It's like, of course all lives matter. We we want that 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 comes often out of a honest um, deep belief in the goodness of of of, of all of us and a and a and a assertion of the value of all lives and I think again it, for the many of the people who represent that or assert that it's 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 coming from the most generous place but it is from a Galton perspective a form of cultural violence does anybody want to write in why. Why do you think it's a form of cultural violence? Silencing, Silencing. Joshua says. Yep. White lives are already protected. Matthew, great. They don't understand the meaning of Black Lives Matter. Right, good, good, good. Doesn't take context into account, excellent. Contemporary uh, perpetuation of societal stratification, excellent, excellent. So it takes the spotlight away from the people who need protection most by trying to make it sound selfish. That's very astute, Kimberly, thank you. All lives matter, but some more than others. Uh, Ginger, really, that, that often is the way it represents itself. Well, let me, first of all, thank you all, and keep, keep, keep putting your comments in there, but let me just say, in the, in the most succinct way, the reason that all lives matter is a form of cultural violence is because it serves to make structural violence invisible. It serves to make structural violence invisible. And when we make structural violence invisible, we um, perpetuate it. Because the only, from a Galtung's perspective and my perspective, the only way to challenge structural violence is to make it explicit and visible and then to confront the implications of it. And when we make it invisible, and we do that a lot here, meritocracy in the US is very much alive and well. And meritocracy is another form of cultural violence because it makes structural violence invisible. It assumes that we all uh, deserve the place in society because this is a land of equal opportunity. We work hard, we can we get what, basically get what we deserve. Even if many people would say that's really not true, we know that that's not true, we still act like it's true. We function in a society very much making that seem true. Uh, and then we make structural violence invisible. And that's why all lives matter. And even if it's heartfelt and honestly, truly felt by people, just as as your very astute comments uh, point out, it does make uh, the Black Lives Matter, it misrepresents Black Lives Matter. And the reason we have to say Black Lives Matter is because they haven't mattered because of structural violence. There hasn't been a, a, an equal uh, attention and care and access uh, because of the embeddedness of um, structural violence in the form of racism. And that's what the Black Lives Matter movement is trying to highlight. So in that context, then, Andy, you can move to the next slide. So cultural peace, a uh, powerful and common form of cultural violence or ideologies that are universally appealing but render structural violence invisible. And then go ahead, uh, one more. Uh, in this way, then, Black Lives Matter, uh, all lives matter in the context of the Black Lives Matter movement is a form of cultural violence 
Black Lives Matter itself is a form of cultural peace because it highlights the opportunity to address structural violence. So again, uh, I hope these these framings is are helpful because they kind of situate the nature of the complexities of these ideas by bringing in the fundamental question of power. And when we don't bring in the fundamental, this is the critical theory framework, when we don't bring in the question of power, then we lose sight and we, and we perpetuate, often unwittingly, but we still perpetuate many forms of structural and direct forms of violence that function then to, uh, because cultural violence gives legitimacy to those forms. And without addressing forms of power, we often end up reproducing them. So one more comment before I uh, close with a, with a final reflection, then open it up to questions. Um, but let's return back to Freire. Uh, we don't have to go back to the slide, Andy. I'll just repeat it. Never in the history of humanity has violence been initiated by the oppressed. Um, again, almost many of you said that you agreed with that quote. Um, is there anyone who still would disagree with that quote? Uh, please don't be shy because it would there, you could still absolutely disagree. Um, anyone? I think it depends on what you mean. Good, good question. Let me just let me just say again because this this it's hard to do this through the chat. But um, I wish we were in the room together. We could we could have a, a pretty rich discussion. I think, but. Uh, Never in the history of humanity has violence been initiated by the oppressed. Now, if you use Galtung's analysis, and I think some of you are starting to articulate this, if you use Galtung's analysis, if you're oppressed, you are already the victim of structural violence, which is, again, often unacknowledged. So, and Freire himself, and nor am I then saying that direct violence then is a, a appropriate or responsible response to this. It's not, it's, there's no, this, the, the statement itself is not making any comment about direct violence. It's saying that we, and we, it's, it's actually a, a, a tool to highlight the existence of structural violence that often goes unacknowledged. So if you're oppressed, you can't initiate violence. You're already the victim of violence. You can still respond in uh, direct form, violent ways. You can you can act in heinous ways in response. But the point is, is that, again, when we hide structural violence, we don't acknowledge a really critical factor in the forces that perpetuate these terrible crimes against humanity that are uh, unfortunately still uh, being replicated today. So back one final comment about religion. Uh, religion is, again, uh, absolutely indicted. <laughs> In, in both expressions of cultural violence and cultural peace. Religions are such powerful forces in human experience. Whether you're actually religious or not, the power of religion as an embedded dimension of culture shapes, and, uh, shapes values, shapes choices, um, positively and negatively. Again, it's not a, it's not a, we can't make a blanket statement about the power of religion as a positive or negative force because it's it's it, it's not a you can't make that you can't make a truthful statement and unfortunately that's so much of the debate we have about religion religion's uh, always a good thing and in fact when it's when when religions are acting in ways we don't like you often hear well that's not really religious that's political or that's cultural um, but it's not religious but that would that's a devotional assertion. That is not a factual assertion about the power of religion. And as scholars of religion, as students of religion, um, that we ourselves as teachers, and I, and I hope our, we want to teach our students to be students of religion, scholars of religion, that the, the way to understand religion is not to live in that binary, but to actually understand the power of religion and then to, uh, to make decisions and judgments about it. And then to think about the nature of what we teach and how religion impacts what we teach and how it's already embedded um, is, a, is, a, is, a, is one way we can use these tools to help kind of unpack the ways that religions already exist in so much of our curricula and in our co contemporary life today. Um, so questions like power, like for me, the question isn't, um, you know, you, there's a different set of questions to say what we think about abortion. For me, for the religion question, 
on the table is, is not like, is abortion right or wrong or is the Southern Baptist right or wrong? Not in this context. The question is, what happened? What gave rise to the assertions in the 1970s about abortion? What were the social, political, and cultural confluences where the, that particular theological expression within Southern Baptist, the Southern Baptist Convention, rose to ascendancy that supported the moral legitimacy of abortion? And what happened? What were the cultural, social, and historical forces that shifted the power dynamic within the Southern Baptist that then gave rise to the more conservative uh, assertions that are currently in ascendancy now. Ask the same questions of the Taliban in Afghanistan. What gives rise to the Taliban? Uh, uh, what were the factors that gave rise to those, what we think of or call extremist forms of religion? Um, and what happened in a historical context because that wasn't always the case there. And what, where are the people say, well, where are the moderate Muslims? Well, they're always there. We just don't necessarily give them attention or voice, but they're always there, um, even in the most, what we think of as extreme situations. Um, and religion, again, is always complicated. So there are always going to be the multitude of voices within any given tradition, or within any given context, that will uh, represent the full spectrum of ideological beliefs about any of the issues that are confronting our human uh, community uh, in, our, in, in very, very... Um, consistent and, pers and persistent ways uh, in our global life together. So religion matters. Uh, it's a really powerful force. And I, um, and I hope that these frameworks give us some language to be able to better tease it out. Um, and I, uh, I'll stop here and then entertain questions or engage in discussion if, uh, if that is of interest to you all. But thank you for your attention to this. And I hope that this framework has been useful. So, uh, Diane, um, let me ask a question, and, I'll, and, and folks are going to sort of come through with some of their own questions as well, and that is, um, both in your time as a, as a secondary level teacher and now at Harvard, what do you see your students struggle with in this framework? What, what kinds of obstacles or what kinds of challenges do they face when grappling with these issues? Yeah, great, great. Um, I, I, I will say, I'm going to speak about my, my experience, not just my own experience in secondary context, but also the, our work that we're doing with teachers in middle and secondary school contexts, uh, and even some primary school contexts around employing this method. Uh, I, I, I'll say that, that, that people are excited about it, even in um, uh, ideologically diverse settings, um, which may be counterintuitive to some people. Because the, 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 the key to introducing this framework for people is to let them know that this is not a challenge to the religious beliefs of any individual student in the classroom. It's a different, when you think about making the distinction between devotional assertion and the study of diverse devotional assertions, what you're, if you introduce it in a way that helps people recognize that this is a way to think about religion. You're giving people language and tools that, um, in fact, that they they very m very regularly find it a, a relief because it helps them then give a better. It gives them language to understand some of the complexities of the roles and and the ways that religions are uh, functioning in our and certainly in the U.S. context now, but across the world. Um, so it's in how you introduce it, and 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 in the and to be transparent about it, um, and to and to make sure that you're transparent and clear in your own mind as to why what what this distinction is, and then to to be prepared to also explain this to parents and to administrators because religion is so deeply misunderstood that um, any assertion or commentary about religion and education will almost inevitably be assumed to be that you're proselytizing. Uh, in the classroom and trying to convert people. So to part of the respect and uh, admiration I have for teachers and appreciation I have for teachers is that you all are on the front lines of this and, and you're both vulnerable to these kind of accusations, but you also have the most power to be able to change this, um, this, this really pr troubling discourse uh, for, 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 for future citizens as well as for actually families now. 
So I, I, the, the reason I'm, I'm going into it that way is because I think most people think, oh, this is going to be too controversial. If you give people this language, both the, the, the uh, First Amendment language, I didn't go into that, but it's pretty well known that the, the teaching about religion is protected in the First Amendment. It's not a violation of the First Amendment. Uh, proselytizing in schools is a violation for public schools is a violation of the First Amendment. So the distinction between the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause, I think, I think people are usually pretty well aware of. I didn't go into that, but I can if you're interested. So it's, it's both legal and appropriate. And in fact, we do it already. We already teach about religion in schools. Um, we teach about it all the time, often unwittingly and often in problematic ways. So making it more transparent and giving people the language and make, giving them the tools can, can be, is often really welcome. And students, in my experience, love this. They love this stuff <laughs> because it gives them, again, it's, it's problem posing education. It, it puts things that aren't easily answered on the table for them to wrestle with in terms of interpretation. And that always, I think, is a good, um, a good tool for teaching. Thank you. Uh, if there are other questions from our audience, please type them into the chat box. Um, Diane, there are a few more slides here. Do you want me to just forward through those? Or sure, is there something yeah, else? please do. Uh, so direct piece, I wanted to just give you the kind of language to say that the corollary to violence Direct peace represents behaviors that serve to preserve life itself, to promote human flourishing, active expressions of respect, kindness, compassion, empathy, healing, generosity, humility. We live often in many cultures of direct peace. Many of our classrooms uh, represent expressions of direct peace. There, um, and so I want to highlight this because, again, uh, these also are malleable. The expression of violence, just like violence is not inevitable, peace is not inevitable. And so it's partly also highlighting the nature of agency. And go ahead, Andy, we'll move through. Structural peace, systemic ways in which groups have equal access to opportunities, goods, and services that enable the fulfillment of basic human needs. Legal structures that enforce equity, affirmative action programs, uh, culturally functional without legal mandate, equal access to quality education, healthcare. The, again, the corollary of the structural violence, cultural structural peace. Also, is um, we, we, we have very only pockets, I'm afraid, of structural peace in smaller communities because the larger, unfortunately, I, I, I will assert that the larger um, context of, of many, many parts of the globe still uh, have embedded structural forms of violence that are still functioning, not just around race and ethnicity, but around many other kinds of isms. But, there, but I do fun fundamentally believe that those structural forms of violence can be uh, mitigated and, and are not inevitable. And structural peace becomes one of the vehicles that we can promote it. And then finally, uh, cultural peace, which is the next slide, represents the existence of prevailing or prominent social norms that make direct or structural peace natural, right, or good. And these become, again, I think in our current uh, political context now, some of these are getting eroded, but um, the, the, the kind of expectation of of respect, of of um, of kindness, the expectation of um, uh, dignity is something again that I think in most of our schools are built into mission statements um, are values that would represent cultural peace. And I'm I'm a big fan of going back to mission statements and back to the aspirational documents of our of our founding uh, of of our founding in the United States, even though that founding was based on, you know. We know we we know that the founding fathers were many of them slave owners. We know it's an imperfect uh, uh, set of assertions, but those documents are such aspirational statements that I think are worthy of our of our lifting up and worthy of trying to aspire to meet them, even if we know historically that we have fallen short very persistently and consistently. Finally, the last slide is if I just want to introduce. Um, oh, this is that's just. Not sorry. One more slide. Um, this there's an exchange of letters. I think so, I hope some of you know this. If you don't, then I I just want to highlight it for you because I think it's just a really powerful exchange of letters between um, a Jewish warden uh, of the temple in in Rhode Island um, named Moses Sexus S E I X A S. 
he, um, George Washington, right after the Constitution was ratified, uh, the um, Rhode Island was the last um, colony to ratify the Constitution. And Washington and Jefferson came to visit in a kind of state visit. And they came and were greeted by dignitaries upon their, their arrival um, on the shores of Rhode Island. And one of the dignitaries that was chosen to greet Washington was the, was the warden of the, of the Jewish temple there. Um, which is in itself a commentary, right? Because uh, uh, the, the fact that there would be a high-ranking citizen who is Jewish, uh, would it, the fact that it happened in Rhode Island is not um, a coincidence. It wouldn't necessarily have happened in other colonies, as I think we're all aware. So that alone is just historically significant. And he wrote this most, it was an incredibly eloquent letter, which I, I, I did not uh, include here. But he basically said to, to Washington, We've been persecuted uh, for our lives. Uh, a combination, it was referencing both the persecution of the Jews for, for millennia, but also um, the persecution from the revolution, from, from, the Brit from the British. And he said, and now we look to, to the new government, to you, uh, to, to, with this new vision, this new hope for, for, for a, new, a new beginning, essentially. And this language, gives to bigotry no sanction and to persecution no assistance, was from Sexus himself. Washington was moved by this assertion and a couple, just a couple days later, this, this exchange of letters is, is, is available online. Uh, you can Google it and the George Washington Institute, you can find it um, the, in, in their entirety. And they're very short, they're great uh, uh, primary source documents. But President Washington writes back a, a beautifully also eloquent letter, but in this letter he says, Happily, the government of the United States was kind of responding to sexist, Moses Sexus saying, which gives to bigotry no sanction, to persecution no assistance, requires only that they who live under its protection should demean themselves as good citizens in giving it on all occasions their effectual support. So, so again, we, we don't do this, <laughs> but what a powerful aspiration to try to live up to. And I think that to have these before ourselves and before our students and the ways that religion then, of course, inspires these and is embedded in them, I think uh, can give us better tools to think about what it means to really be promoting the possibility for the future of our democracy, which I think my personal belief is that now uh, that future is somewhat in peril with our current um, discourses and the current divisions that are so pronounced. The divisions have always been there, but they're now explicit and pronounced. And I hope that this time can become a catalyst for us to, uh, to challenge those divisions and to address the structural violences that I think uh, give rise to them. So that's, now I am done. That's my last slide, yeah. so. <laughs> not, not quite. Thank you. Um, so it's interesting to end with, with this historical document and it leads to a question for me, which is in your view, uh, have we as a nation, as a, in America, have we become more or less religiously literate? In other words, how, how much has this changed in the last 200 years? Um, I think we are, uh, I think there's been a pretty persistent lack of understanding about religion because uh, we've conflated religious belief with, um, with, with religion always. And that we haven't had the, have, haven't as a, as a, as a culture, we have in our scholarship, but we haven't as a culture really had the language to recognize that religions are complex and do internally diverse. We, we tend to then just associate whatever is the ascendant voice of religion with, with, with religion itself. So the, the capacity for us to continue to reproduce the kind of uh, terrible, uh, usually terrible challenges. Like what the, for the longest time, as we know, Jews were the persecuted minority in the United States. And before them, it was, the Rome, it was Roman Catholics. Um, and, and before them, and within the history of the United States, there have been factions within pro, the, the, even the hegemony of Protestantism, where factions within Protestantism would be uh, at, at odds with one another. Um, and now we, of course, the current one is Muslims. Um, so for me, this, this lack of understanding of tools to challenge the, the dominant uh, discourses about religion are, have been pretty persistent 
And my hope is that if we get better tools to at least unpack that, that they won't be so easily reproduced. Thank you, Diane. Uh, are there any last questions from the audience? We, you've given us so much to consider and think about. Uh, there's been uh, some pretty robust conversations in the chat room, um, but I wonder if there are any last questions for Diane. I'll also remind you to uh, visit the Religious Literacy Project that we put the URL up for in the, in the, um, in the lead slide. And you described that a little bit, Diane, but I wonder if you could give us just in, in um, uh, to wrap tonight up, I wonder if you could give us sort of the history of how that, that project began and wh where the genesis of that project was. Sure, yeah, yeah, I'd love to. Um, thanks, Andy, for the opportunity. So the Religious Literacy Project is actually the successor to what was uh, a, a nearly 35-year-old program at the Divinity School that I had the privilege of um, directing for the last um, 10 years of its existence, uh, which was a kind of mini ed school program at the Divinity School where we actually, people came to learn and, and to get a master's degree in the academic study of religion, but also could graduate with a license to teach middle or secondary school in any of the, uh, any just actually the only discipline we didn't give licensure in was math. So most of our students were uh, majoring in history or English language arts, uh, but we also had people teaching sciences and uh, many romance languages. Uh, but that, that program was, um, uh, and, and they learned then how to teach about those topics with embedded, the ways that religions are already embedded in those topics. So they had a pretty sophisticated understanding of religion through their master's degree. Uh, 2008, the crash happened and so that uh, program was suspended because um, it was pretty expensive to run and it was relatively small. And so at the time then I didn't quite know what to do but I decided to create the Religious Literacy Project out of, of that um, and now it's, uh, one of those strange things that's probably probably was a, a blessing in disguise, although at the time it was pretty devastating. But the Religious Literacy Project now still is devoted to the 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 the, the uh, our our mission is is to promote and enhance the public understanding of religion, and our primary work is still with teachers and educators, but now in service teachers. Um, but we also do a lot of work now with professionals in other arenas in uh, journalism in humanitarian action, in business, in government. Uh, so we're looking at, again, these same frameworks for how to understand religion in different fields that are relevant for better cultural and um, understanding of the complexities of religion on the ground for many many of these professions. Uh, for teachers, though, we're, we're, uh, we're really excited. We're going to launch a new, we, we ran a pilot last summer that was very excited and exciting and successful. We're going to launch a new um, uh, teacher institute this summer uh, where the teachers will come for, for, for three and a half or probably three and a half or four and a half days. We haven't decided for sure. Uh, fully funded. It'll be a group of, it'll be by application, but to teachers of, from any discipline, but to, to learn this method and to have a chance to workshop uh, ways to embed and imply this method in their own teaching. Um, and we will be able to fund uh, travel and, and all, all the expenses for that, for that opportunity. And we, we had a wonderful pilot from that last year, which was, and, we, and we're continuing to work with the teachers in that, in that pilot to become master teacher educators themselves, to be able to share and, and, and teach this method uh, themselves among their peers. It's been a really rich opportunity for us. And out of that workshop too, we're creating a host of, of new resources because we've learned more and more from teachers. I, I work, we've got a, like you do Andy, we've got a, a group of teachers who are our advisors um, from around the country who help us understand what are the kinds of resources that would be most useful for teachers. And so we're also creating many, many different resources, uh, case studies, um, country profiles, religion profiles that um, that teachers that we're vetting now in classrooms and teachers are finding really useful. So again, it represents this method. That's the key for us. What what we do is consistent is about this framework I just introduced you to. Everything we create and produce is representing this framework. Um, so so again, I, I'd love to, to be in conversation with any of you all if you're interested in learning more about that institute. Uh, uh, write to me, we'll get you on our mailing list. Um, and also just 
just get, give you more information about the religious literacy project itself. But our, but I'm very excited about this new initiative, um, and we and excited to be able to to extend our work um, beyond the um, cohorts of teachers we've had a chance to work with over the last few few years. Uh, thank you, Diane. And, and maybe as I'm starting to wrap up tonight's webinar, you can add your email address into the chat box and maybe the link to the Religious Literacy uh, Project. And yeah. again, we would encourage uh, all attendees to uh, visit the site, pay attention to the resources, be thoughtful about the ways that this framework might apply to your own classroom culture and, and climate, and, and also uh, think about ways that you can um, can integrate that. So, uh, Diane, I want to thank you so much for leading this nice conversation. We really do appreciate uh, your thoughtful insights to this, and I can tell from our chat box that uh, all of the teachers not only are interested, but but continuing to grapple with the best way to approach this. And Diane, thank you so much. You're very welcome, and thank you all. It's been an incredible privilege to be here. Um, and I, uh, again, I'd love to be in conversation with any of you. Uh, so, got my email and also the uh, Religious Literacy Project. But if you just Google my name or religious literacy project you can get these They're, they usually come up pretty pretty quickly but thank you thank you andy for the important work you're doing and again thank all of you for for being being spending spending your precious um late afternoon and early evening here with us so uh the best way to follow what's happening at the national humanities center is to visit our website and also to join our various social media networks our facebook page our uh, Pinterest page, our uh, Instagram, and most importantly, our Twitter uh, feed is always uh, giving you up-to-date um, information about our ongoing both face-to-face -face and virtual professional development opportunities. Don't forget tonight that once I close the room, probably around 45 after the hour, uh, you'll receive a, an evaluation to complete, and uh, after completing that, you'll receive the certificate for uh, joining us tonight. Um, tonight's session has been recorded, and you will have access to this on our YouTube channel, as well as the associated materials, including the PowerPoint, and we'll make sure we, we usually get those up within uh, 48 hours, although with Libby on maternity leave, it might, it might take an extra day or so. And I do want to encourage you to join us for upcoming webinars. Uh, next uh, week, February the 20th, two weeks from now, actually, February the 20th, uh, we'll be working with Mary Catton Lingold from the uh, Virginia Commonwealth University. Uh, titled Listening to Literature, Hearing History. Uh, she'll be focused on the soundscapes of literature. And unfortunately, that webinar is sold out. But again, if you're interested, please email me and we'll put you on the waiting list. Uh, after that, we'll be working with Kent Germany from the University of South Carolina on the declassified secret White House tapes of the Kennedy, the Johnson, and the Nixon administrations. It's absolutely fascinating to hear these sort of unfiltered, unvarnished moments of these presidential icons. And Kent will uh, not only play these, but kind of interpret them and help uh, understand the way they fit into historical context. That webinar too is sold out. But again, if you're interested, please send me uh, your name and I'll put you on a waiting list. Um, and then on February 28th, we do have um, some spaces available. I think it's probably under a dozen for uh, a conversation with Fitz Brundage and Kevin Levin on Confederate monuments and this understanding of civic space in the U.S., very topical and relevant. So please take some time to sign up for uh, for one or more of those. Look through the rest of our spring calendar. And hopefully we'll see you next time with the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Good night, everyone. Have a great day at school tomorrow. Great. Thanks, Andy. Good night.